OK, bonjour, bienvenue. C'est un autre euh, webinaire euh, régulier de la chaire sur le décarbonisation. Moi, c'est Mark Burden. Je suis ici avec euh, Colin Murphy de l'Université de California, Davis. Euh, on va attendre un petit peu pour, euh, pour laisser les participantes euh, euh, rentrer dans la salle virtuelle. Euh, mais euh, je vais aussi switcher en anglais parce que ce webinaire est en anglais. Euh, euh, mais voilà. So, uh, I thank you very much for participating, Colin. Uh, uh, Colin Murphy, participating from uh, UC Davis. Um, is It's a real uh, pleasure to have uh, you, you involved. And uh, we'll let the participants uh, roll into the meeting. And we'll start in just a minute. So this, uh, just uh, as we're waiting another minute for people to 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 come into the event, uh, we have about um, we're going to talk about the uh, California Quebec carbon market, um, and we're going to give a bit of a, a a review or update of what's going on in Washington as well. Um, as I think maybe many of you might know, the state of Washington is now anticipating to to join. <clears throat> the uh, California Quebec carbon market, which has some could have uh, some implications for for carbon prices. Uh, so I'll just get started and see if I can advance the slides here. Uh, so yeah, so we're going to kind of go through uh, what happened at the uh, auction of last month, um, in February fourteenth. Uh, look at prices and proportion of emission allowances um, sold were actually purchased by uh, compliance entities. Uh, and then we're going to look at some of the same issues in Washington State, which had its most recent auction in December of 2023. We're then going to bring everyone up to date what's going on at the Canadian federal carbon price and just have a brief comparison of the uh, different carbon pricing instruments. So just to give some uh, background um, and why we're kind of breaking the the discussion um, uh, amongst these jurisdictions is, well, uh, California, Quebec, and Washington are part of the Western Climate Initiative. Canada uh, has its own carbon pricing instrument, the rest of Canada, although Nova Scotia is also part of the Western Climate Initiative, but their, their carbon pricing system is a, a bit complicated for the moment uh, and might be reverting to the federal carbon price, but California, Quebec, and Washington, um, California, Quebec, of course, are linked in terms of their uh, carbon markets. Uh, Washington has a, had a cap and invest program for the past year or two, um, but um, they're thinking of linking with California and Quebec if California, Quebec will, will oblige. So just like looking at the emission reduction targets across these jurisdictions, I think the important thing is if we look at the 2030 emission reduction targets, um, California looking for 40% below 1990, 45% uh, below in Washington, 375 below 1990 levels in Quebec. Um, federal Canadian government, uh, there's a little variation between 26 to 32% below 1990 levels. Um, a bit more ambitious uh, in um, California, Washington, Canada for 2050, uh, net zero in Canada, 90% below in Washington, 85% below 1990 levels by 2045 in California. I believe the Quebec government is still elaborating their 2050 uh, uh, target, but their um, attempts to commit to carbon neutrality by 2050. I know, Carmen, uh, Colin, if you had anything to add to that slide, if there's any updates on... Uh, um, the California program is about to go through a rulemaking that's going to update the long run targets. And I'll discuss that a little bit more in one of the slides that comes later. Sure. Um, so just to kind of, uh, when we're talking about the California Quebec carbon market, is we can think of the, the two caps being uh, added one on top of the other. Um, and uh, essentially the emissions, uh, that cap being reduced uh, over time. So we had the first commitment period from 2013 to 2020. We'll touch on that, those results a little later in this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, but we're now in the 2020-2030 um, reduction phase. And uh, so it's just a schematic of where things are supposed to go, uh, uh, reducing to uh, 
to by 2030. Um, and just some basics of how the uh, uh, allowances are allocated in the California Quebec carbon market. Um, there are four auctions a year, and we use these as opportunity to have these these uh, discussions, power uh, webinars. Uh, the auction price floor started at ten dollars in two thousand thirteen, uh, and it increases five percent each year plus inflation. And this price floor, uh, I think it was a real innovation at the time it was first introduced. Uh, to sort of correct some of the unintended effects of overallocation of emission allowances by having that fixed carbon price floor. Uh, there's also a carbon price ceiling. Um, it's more uh, robust, I think, uh, uh, on the California side. The uh, Initially, there's an allowance price containment reserve. Um, this was refer reformed uh, uh, for 2021, starting 2021. Um, and that there's a firmer price starting at $65 U.S. in 2021, and that's also so to increase 5% per year. Um, turning towards free allocations, why I often attract some, some uh, 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 attention uh, in the media. So the free allocations, there are a lot of free allocations at first in the California Quebec carbon market, 80% uh, free on the Quebec side. And the idea behind that is to um, incentivize firms that really it's very difficult for them to reduce their emissions. So one of the, the, the classic examples is the aluminum industry in Quebec, which has historically uh, found it very, very difficult to, to reduce emissions from the production of aluminum because most of the emissions are, are process, uh, uh, related to the production process of aluminum and not necessarily the consumption of energy. Uh, that might be changing. We can maybe talk about that at some other point. Uh, there's some breakthroughs there. Um, but some of the another important thing is 2015, 2020, and I'll go back to the slide. You had a the addition of of uh, large industrial emitters plus distributors of uh, liquid um, fuels, and in the California Quebec carbon market, and then the proportion of allowances dropped to around 20 percent. And as I understand, the Quebec government is now developing regulations to reduce free allocations for the 2024, 2030 period. No, Colin, if there's anything you wanted to add to that slide. Uh, no, that, that's good. I think the next one is where I have more thoughts. Great. Um, and to just kind of touch on this, I've perhaps presented this too much uh, already, but just to, when we combine the emission uh, inventories from the two jurisdictions and compare it to their, their targets, we see that the Quebec, California carbon market surpassed the uh, target uh, already, uh, I think in 2016 or uh, 18, um, and um, Quebec purchased a number of those emissions allowances. So a lot of the emission reductions happening on California territory. There might even be a slight increase uh, in 2018, 2019. I need to update these slides when we can. Um, but when we look at the 2020 emission reduction target, uh, Quebec reduced its emissions by 13% below 99 levels when looking just at the Quebec territory. And there's a study put out by the Ministry of Environment saying that this is a 27% uh, below reduction when you include emission reductions purchased in California. And I think Carl, and I would just Colin, say that, oh. yeah, and I would, I would just say from that last slide, you can see that we've hit the the targets for aggregate emissions from the, the combined area. And this has really defined one of the dominant market trends in the cap and trade space for a while where there has been a significant oversupply of allowances relative to the emissions and led to a very significant bank building up. Um, for quite some time, CARB was very resistant to making any changes to this uh, for a variety of reasons we can go into if it really matters. They are now that the scoping plan in California was released in 2022 um, and with a rulemaking for the cap and trade program anticipated either this year or next, quite could, could possibly start this year and conclude next year. Um, they are announcing an intention to reduce the amount of emissions and, and try to bring the market a little bit back closer towards balance. Can I get the next slide, please? What up? Um, <clears throat> so this is, is some of the, the proposals that they are currently considering. The, the rulemaking is in a, a pre-rulemaking period, so none of these are really considered sort of official proposals. They are numbers that CARB put out at a workshop last November um, in order to seek feedback from the uh, community of uh, researchers as well as market um, uh, participants. 
Um, they are looking at a number of scenarios. Those are in the table in the lower left. I put the sort of alternative one, two, and three to align them to um, the graph on the right, which comes from modeling done by some of my colleagues at UC Davis, um, looking at expected prices under a number of different scenarios. And so in the period from 2021 through 2030, you're looking at aggregate emissions, uh, you know, a little over 3 billion uh, metric tons total. Um, and the various uh, updates they're thinking about um, will either take, would, would sort of align with either kind of 40%, 48 or 55% total reductions in emissions from cap sectors. So under those three options, they would um, involve reducing the number of allowances beyond the target that had been previously adopted um, last in, in 2018 by an additional you know, 130, 280, or about 410 million tons beyond that. And so they're really, um, that kind of defines the range that they're looking at right now of, of uh, aggregate GHG reductions of uh, somewhere between 40 and 55%. Um, essentially, California has a carbon neutrality target in, of, uh, in, in 2045. Um, given the difficulty in reducing emissions from some, from some sectors, notably agriculture, they're viewing a need to over comply out of sectors in the, the cap and trade program in order um, to both hit the 40% the greenhouse gas reduction target, which is a, a law that was passed in 2016, um, or to be on course for the carbon neutrality in 2045. So this is sort of the, the crux of, of the debate right now of you know, how ambitious they want to be within this program. Um, the, the other uh, kind of design issue that they're considering is whether to remove the um, allowances from just the general future uh, pool that are going to be auctioned or to remove them from the auction price containment reserve pools, which only get triggered if the price gets above specified levels. Thanks. Thank you can you. go on, Mark. Perfect. So let's see what's going on in the market. Um, and we had a spring break here last week, so we're 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 maybe some of you already snuck a peek at the uh, the auction results. But um, uh, so the the news is that there was a slight increase. Um, so we'll talk maybe in Canadian dollars. Um, but the price floor is at thirty two uh, uh thirty two dollars fifty nine cents per ton for the current vintage, but the settlement price, so what auction price uh settled at was at fifty six sixty one. Um. Future vintages were just slightly less than that. Uh, so that's sort of interesting. Um, Colin, maybe I'll, I'll skip to the next slide with the graph so we can see the historical evolution, but uh, we can just, we can maybe dwell a bit on this slide if we want. Um, but we can see that the, uh, the green slide, the green line on the current is, is kind of been going up and this is sort of, it's not as, as, I think it was fifty dollars uh, Canadian uh, previously, so it's fifty three. Maybe it's gone up to about fifty six. So not a, as big an increase, I think, as in past auctions, um, but still upward tra trajectory um, and clearly departing from the uh, the carbon price floor. Um, and we see that trajectory on the um, on the future uh, future vintages as well. So. Um, this is an interesting trend that we've seen since 2021 and sort of accelerated uh, since um, 2022. I'll call it, if you have any perspectives on that. You know, really what we've seen is, is the, the price riding the floor for most of the history of, of this program. And it was always sort of realized by most of the, the researchers and energy system modelers that um, a price at the floor was not going to result in the level of emissions reductions that were necessary for any jurisdiction to to reach it, its goal. You know, it was set at uh, twenty dollars or so originally, and uh, a little below twenty U.S. and, and increased with uh, inflation and, and um, well, over time. So we we knew that if we were going to take climate change seriously, this this had to happen. So in some ways, this is sort of expected and and. Uh, welcome behavior from from a greenhouse gas policy standpoint. You know now the question is um, how long is this trajectory likely to continue, and to what extent are market participants pricing in anticipated future rule changes as they make decisions right now? You know there's there's enough there's enough uh, credits banked that at least on the whole most participants don't need to buy, you know, a lot of, of credits don't need to be driving the price off the, off the floor right now for near-term compliance. 
this seems most likely a reflection of expectations about long-term compliance and um, a, a view that uh, that yeah that the the credit price is likely to continue increasing um, over time and certainly the anticipated rulemakings play into that. We can come back to these trends a little later if we want to have some more discussion. Uh, for participants in the audience, uh, feel free to, we'll have a question and answer period at the end. So um, please bear with us. Um, there's this uh, metric they put there, proportion of allowance purchased by compliance entities. This has slightly gone up. Uh, I'll show you again in a historical perspective, but the, the results from the last auction were 86.5% of auction allowances. I think all the allowances were purchased um, that's another kind of maybe um, indicator we should we should put together. Uh, but of the of all the auctions uh, sold, um, eighty six point five were purchased by compliance entities. So emission, so firms or um, uh, corporations that have emission reduction targets uh, imposed on them um, by the uh, Quebec and California governments. So it suggests that there's some market players that are, you know, the other 15% uh, that are maybe just buying up credits because they know that the, or they anticipate the price continuing to rise. Um, a little 74.6 for the future vintage. I'll show this in historical perspective again. So um, again, just uh, going back to 2015, proportion of allowances purchased by compliance entities since 2015, you see that the, the uh, proportion is declining, um, but again, this is not the number of allowances sold. Um, this is the amount of allowances purchased by compliance entities. So it suggests that other players are getting in the market, the financial players, uh, so people without emission reduction obligations. Um, and that could be putting upward pr uh, pressure on the price. Um, but of course, I, I think, uh, what I'm realizing is we need to get and get another slide with the um, actual uh, percentages of uh, allowances sold um, uh, at each auction, how much of allowances that were offered were, were actually sold. Um, but anyway, it's an interesting trend. I don't know, Colin, if there's any any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, really, there's sort of two categories of, of non-compliance entities that would purchase that I can see. Some of them are, are speculators. Um, who are you know essentially banking on on future carbon price, and then some of it is also going to be brokers and traders who need to have their own supply of credits to allow to be a counterparty, you know, in their role as a as a, a broker or, or trader. Um, I, I don't have any real visibility uh, into what fractions sort of fall into either bucket. Um, again, to some extent, this is behavior that that was anticipated. We realize that as these markets get larger, as they get you know more important, and as more entities start to enter the climate finance space, we're going to see more players coming into this space and, uh, and, and you know, sort of having it function more like a, a, a commodities market um, or environmental instrument market rather than, than just a regulatory compliance uh, instrument. Okay, well, we'll turn now to Washington. Um, and as I uh, indicated earlier, um, Washington has had its cap and invest program up for a uh, I think maybe a year or two now, maybe two years. Um, and last November, they um, made an official uh, request to to link with the California Quebec carbon market. So Washington has developed its cap and invest program under the same uh, framework, the Western Climate Initiative uh, rules as California Quebec, um, and now is seeking to link because it's, it hasn't, it's been running uh, in parallel. So it's just interesting to see what's been going on in Washington. Um, and I guess the, the take home, this is the prices obtained at the December 23rd, December 2023 auction. Uh, the prices are, are, are significantly higher than what we're, we're seeing in California and Quebec right now. Um, in terms of Canadian prices, the price floor is at 29.7 and the settlement price was at 69.42. So, um, $70 future vintages were, were, um, considerably lower uh, at $60 Canadian uh, versus uh, 69.42 for the, the current vintage. And I'll show you a slide of how that's developed historically. I think um, these prices are actually even reduced from where they were at the August uh, auction of the Washington um, Cap and Invest program. Um, 
also uh, perhaps uh, of note is the uh, there is a auction of the um, auction uh, auction cost auction compliance auction price, price containment <laughs> yeah auction um, containment price reserve I think it yeah. actually in California it's the APCR not the ACPR it's possible Washington chose a slightly different name or, or acronym for their version of it it's um, also but this is this go ahead go ahead sorry <laughs> I was going to say yeah this is essentially a reserve of, of credits California has a, a similar function where when certain price thresholds are reached um, a reserve of credits is immediately issued it's kind of meant to be a speed bump for rapid price increases in the program to um, provide some some credits to, to near term resolve any shortage of credits in the market and give the market to sort of recalibrate and, and see if further price increases beyond the APCR level are needed. Um, I haven't tracked the Washington program you know, nearly as, as closely as I have in California, um, but I, I would say that I and quite a few of us in California were rather surprised to see Washington trigger the APCR so soon after having their their uh, program emerge. Usually you expect you know, a year or two of relatively low targets um, and, you know, markets taking some time to to get up to speed with it. I think that the fact that the APCR triggered up there um, most likely implies a couple of things. One is that the participants in that market um, believe that the trajectory the market's on is going to require, you know, significant reductions and, and that credits are going to become um, more expensive than at least that first, a, you know, that the first APCR threshold. Uh, so there's an expectation of, of rising prices, and and they're looking to sort of get in um, and ensure that that um, you know they have a, a reasonable backlog of, of credits, a bank of credits, uh, if necessary. Second, I think it shows that just there are a lot more that that participants in the market, both in compliance entities and and non-compliance entities. Are just a lot more used to these markets and have a, a playbook um, and are ready to, to start moving quickly on something um, because you know it's it's historically we would have thought it, it's kind of hard to adjust to see a lot of compliance entities paying prices significantly above the the floor price for containment credits for a market that hadn't existed usually they'd want to see more of a you know price trend um, to get a sense of, of where it was going to be now i think the, a lot more participants are confident in their modeling tools and their projection capabilities to say, we want to buy prices significantly above the floor early on. Um, I think some of this might be uh, entities wanting to build up a, a, a bank of credits, you know, as a, a hedge against future price volatility. Um, you know, certainly it, it's possible that having a, a bank of credits is necessary for some of their, you know, risk mitigation um, or, you know, capital capital sufficiency uh, checks on on other um, other areas of other balance sheets. So it, it's possible this desire to quickly build up a reasonable hedge uh, or a reasonable bank of credits compared to their annual obligations as a hedge against future volatility might be contributing to this really rapid price increase. So um, it's going to be interesting to you know see folks who are closer to that market start to to deconstruct why we saw um, a, a price increase that that rapid. And I'll show you in the next slide, we have the historical trajectory, what's been going on in, well, actually, maybe it's not in the next slide. Um, a little later on, I'll show you the trajectory. Um, we also have these numbers on the uh, uh, proportion of allowance purchased by compliance entities, 87% for current and 69.2% for the, for the future vintage. Um, I'm going to continue through, because I think this, I think I have the, uh, historical trajectory of, of, of Washington prices on a final slide. Uh, so let's maybe turn to the Canadian federal carbon tax. Um, and I think the, the sort of the news here is um, uh, the, this is coming from the 2020 federal carbon, federal climate plan, uh, which has um, uh, introduced the uh, perhaps a, a, a more a substantial increase in carbon prices that are slated to reach $170 per ton uh, by 2030. Uh, these are all Canadian dollars, um, increasing by $15 per year. Uh, importantly, the federal carbon tax is revenue neutral with tax rebates uh, sent to individuals and businesses. I think on a quarterly basis, we don't, this, uh, this carbon uh, uh Pricing uh, system, the carbon tax is not applied here in Quebec because of the uh, existing um, cap and trade system. 
may have been deemed equivalent. We can maybe discuss equivalency at some other point. Um, but the important thing here is currently dollar uh, prices are $65 Canadian per ton CO2, not CO2-3. <laughs> That's a typo. Um, and they're set to rise uh, to $80 in April. Uh, so that's usually the fiscal start of the new fiscal year. Um, what's perhaps uh, interesting, and and maybe some uh, participants may want to discuss this, is uh, there's been some um, uh, a bit of controversy at the federal level. Um, most notably, I think last November, there was a carve out um, that sort of um, withdrew heating oil and some other um, <clears throat> some other. I believe it was I think it was mostly heating oil. Uh, from uh, being subject to the federal carbon tax and that kind of, there was some. Um, if you looked at it from sort of political perspective, you could you could argue that that was to benefit certain um, constituents in, in the Maritimes, uh, uh, Canada. Anyway, we could talk about that, but there, there, the the carbon price, the carbon tax, uh, does seem to be a a bit of attacking attracting some. Uh, uh, political tension from the conservatives uh, right now. Um, but we should also bear in mind that there are additional uh, carbon pricing measures in place at the federal level. You have this output-based pricing system, which is sort of to kind of address um, uh, um, uh, competitiveness issues for the, uh, the industry in different parts of uh, across Canada. There's also a federal carbon offset system, which we can maybe talk about at some other time. Uh, but there's also many other complementary policies and regulations, clean fuel regulations, which I know Colin has been tracking quite closely, which resembles a low carbon fuel standard in California, and just a host of other uh, regulations. So there's a lot going on, more than just the carbon tax, but it's um, it's a good benchmark to allow us to make some comparisons. So that's what we'll do in this last slide. <clears throat> and here we have the uh, red is the uh, Kidney Federal Carbon Tax price, which is uh, $65 um, in early 2024, should be going up to 80 in April. Um, and we see that the Quebec, California carbon price on uh, the settlement price is kind of creeping upwards. It's, 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 it's still uh, at least $10 below um, and uh, will be $25 below come April. Um, as that federal carbon price is slated to slide, uh, increase. But what I think is interesting is here, the Washington, uh, the price trends in Washington, um, they were going up quite quite substantially um, since the, they started the auctions in 2022. Um, and they seem to have peaked in August of, of this year around above about $85 Canadian. Uh, and then they were brought down to about $70 um, as of the December auction. So um, it's interesting that when we look at California, Quebec, and we compare to Washington, um, if if the two were to link, it suggests that, well, the California, Quebec price would, would rise uh, a bit. I don't know how much, um, um, but I don't know. Maybe I, I'm talking too fast. I know, Colin, if you have any reactions there. So I don't think it would be particularly much, at least in the short term, if Washington joined for two reasons. One is just that the Washington market is, is small compared to the California-Quebec joint market. So, you know, there's kind of like a, um, an, an inertia. You're right the the prices would converge toward each other, but the, the sort of California-Quebec price is going to have a lot more a lot more mass, a lot more gravitational pull. Washington's more likely to come close to, to California-Quebec than, than vice yeah. versa. The other thing is, you know, if the the reason why I sort of speculated on earlier that we're seeing um, a lot of companies try to build up hedging positions and that they're not necessarily worried about short term compliance, but they're more trying to you know sort of build a reserve of, of credits, that is by nature a bit of a, a temporary effect, and so you know, you might you might expect to see a a relatively high demand early in the pro, you know in the first few months of progress. Everybody's trying to buy credits in order to build up their own personal hedge, and then it would relax as they got into their their equilibrium. Now, again, that's speculation. I, I don't have enough data to, to conclusively say that that is what's happening, but at the very least, it would um, provide one explanation that matches with the evidence we're seeing and would imply um, a relaxation in, in price, not a not a complete collapse. You know, at the point where, where you saw the price go up, there is clearly an expectation mark that the prices are going to be relatively high over the long term. Um, but 
you know that that you wouldn't see a continued growth at the at the rates that we've seen from Washington so far. So um, so yes, the, that the gravitational pull exists, but I wouldn't expect the California and Quebec prices to go up a lot as a result. Certainly, the anticipated change in the California cap and trade allowance um, is going to be, a, I think, a much bigger um, motivating force on on prices in that market moving forward. Absolutely. Thanks for those comments. Um, that uh, sort of uh, brings us to the end of the this uh, this webinar. Um, we'll open the floor for some questions. Um, and uh, I think we have some participants. I think the way the question and answer period for going with these Zoom uh, webinars. The high demand early in the pro, you know, in the first few months of progress, everybody's trying to buy credits in order to build up their own personal hedge. And then it would relax as they got into their, their equilibrium. Now, again, that's speculation. I, I don't have enough data to, to conclusively say that that is what's happening. But at the very least, it would um, provide one explanation that matches with the evidence we're seeing and would imply um, a relaxation in, in price, not a not a complete collapse. You know, at the point where, where you saw the price go up, there is clearly an expectation of the market that the prices are going to be relatively high over the long term. Um, but you know that that you wouldn't see a continued growth at the at the rates that we've seen from Washington so far. So um, so yes, the, that the gravitational pull exists, but I wouldn't expect the California and Quebec prices to go up a lot as a result. Certainly, the anticipated change in the California cap and trade allowance um, is going to be, a, I think, a much bigger um, motivating force on on prices in that market moving forward. Absolutely. Thanks for those comments. Um, that uh, sort of uh, brings us to the end of the this uh, this webinar. Um... Yeah.